Hello, everyone, and welcome to Texapa Live. I'm Harold Mullen, and we are delighted that you are here with us today. And we uh, continue our discussion on friction. Uh, today's topic is how materials and mixed designs affect friction. And with us today, we have Robert E. Lee to help us with that conversation. But before I get to Robert, I guess, Robert, I'll ask you, how in the world are you doing? I'm doing good. Good. Thanks for asking, Harold. You, you bet. We haven't seen Robert in quite a while. He's been in the office today, and we've had a, a great time catching up with each other. And and I do want to say, as we uh, as we get kicked off here, y'all know Robert as as the former uh, flexible payments director at TechSpot. You know him as a great engineer now in the uh, performance area with CRH, America's Materials. But you know, there's a couple other things people might not know about Robert Lee. And number one is Robert's a great Musical artist and songwriter. Uh -oh. Is that correct? I, I yeah. dabble. I <laughs> dabble. You know, dabble. you know another thing, Robert. Did you bring your did. guitar? Yes. No, he didn't. Oh no. man, we could have had a solo. You know, another thing he's good at is touring cemeteries. Is that yeah, right? That is a true, true he, fact. He, he liked to tour cemeteries. Another thing history is, is history is always it's important. Know, it's it's important to learn from history and there you go. And you can you can glean a lot of information by a good history tour of a cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I can't I can't have a conversation with Robert Lee without talking about Texas Tech University. And he is a a uh, engineer oh, of the year from uh, the Texas Tech alumni. So uh, congratulations on that. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, also, Robert uh, has been uh, he's very active in the Southeast Asphalt User Producer Group that uh, all of us belong to, it seems like. And Robert has been in all kind of positions there, including the chair and is still on the board. Correct. Right. Absolutely. Well, congratulations yeah. on that. Uh, also, one of the most important things is Robert Lee is the winner of the Texapa Texapa Squares show. I'm undefeated. Undefeated. <laughs> Undefeated. I have not found my challenger yet. Dale Rand was, you know, a great competitor, but just not quite. <laughs> <laughs> well, Robert, we appreciate you so much. With that show, we raised a lot of money for our scholarship mm -hmm. program. That's what it's all about, right? We, we, you bet. And we just thank you so much. But thank you for being here. Uh, Robert has a lot of knowledge coming from all the different places that he's come <clears> to <throat> to talk to us. Uh, about friction. But before we do, Jim, I want to know about asphalt skittles, that bite-sized bitumen. What's up with that? Well, you know, it's a, uh, it's a new product that just came out. And uh, we are excited to, to have it out there. In the, uh, in the marketplace. <laughs> and uh, it will be available. Um, Chuck Fuller is selling it. And uh, he'll, he'll be at the HEB on the Slaughter Lane uh, from 5 to 7.30 tonight. Um, just look for Chuck. Everybody knows what he looks like, and they're selling them for a nine ninety five a pack because they are a limited edition. And just uh, ask for Chuck. Uh, I guess he'll be selling that out of the back of his car. Yeah, he's out of the back. Of his okay, car. in yeah. the parking yeah. lot. You got yeah. it. And okay. he'll he'll have his dog there. Wink will be there, and uh, you can pet Wink for a dollar. And all that goes to the scholarship <laughs> fund. So um, get your skittles and pet Wink, and it'll be a good day. It'll okay. Thank goodness April Fools only comes around once a year is all I can say. So uh, thank you so much for that April Fools joke and remind us about what today is. So, somebody uh, Jim, better, thank somebody you better, Jenna. Somebody thank better you. tell Chuck not to be at HCB at five. So yeah, just, yeah. Just saying. Uh, I'm saying that. <laughs> I know uh, we have a, a safety share all the time for, for our shows, and we're known for safety shares. And, Robert, I just want to real quickly run through when we had a safety share in our meeting the other day called Back to Basics. It's about tips to help you be a safer driver. And I want you to do a little self-assessment for me today about your trip uh, coming in uh, to, uh, to Texas Apple uh -oh. and uh, how you did with these safety tips and, and doing what you're supposed to on the roadway to prevent uh, more fatalities on our roadway. So number one, always wear your seatbelt. Did you wear your seatbelt? I, I did. Keep your eyes on the road. I did do that. Use your turn signals. I mainly did that. Yeah, I didn't do that today. Do I don't that. I don't know why. Uh, don't tailgate. Um, yeah, no, I didn't tailgate. Whoa, really? Well, yeah. <laughs> Define tailgate. How close? Real close. Oh, no, not real. Well, I mean, Less than 10 feet? 
This no, be, no, no, no. Could, could, could you see the bottom of the tires of the vehicle? Inside? Yeah, I could. Well, that, yeah. All right. All right. Uh, use your headlights. Mine automatically come on, so I guess I do. Make complete stops. Yeah. I did not do that today. I, I'm, I'm bad about that. Uh, merge early and allow others to merge. Okay, now that's a little bit difficult. You don't allow others to merge? No. Yeah. That's right. a sign of weakness. <laughs> uh, follow speed limits. Uh, yeah, for the most part, absolutely. Okay. How'd you do on that one, Harold? Uh, yeah, how'd you do, Harold? Uh, uh, only use a left lane for passing. <laughs> I did that. Did you really? Yeah. So, well, you know, you got multiple lanes on the freeway, so I'm not out in the rural country, you know, or it's a little bit okay. different for you. So. Respect school zones, work zones, and other traffic. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's important. Excellent. Be considered a cyclist. Yeah. Any kind of cyclist out there? Okay. Never drive under the influence. I know you weren't drinking this morning, were you? No. Okay. Good. Uh, put away distracting devices. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. No. 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 Well, you, yeah. No devices. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> and pull over for active emergency vehicles. I try to do that too. Good. Yeah. And so for funerals, that's for, well, that's, that's respect. For, yeah. You bet. Absolutely. Uh, so you can see, you know, self-assessment, how yeah. you did. You didn't and, ask me the important question. What was the important question? About the, the, the end of your trip. Oh, a parking, of course. Did you pull straight in? Did you pull through? Or did you back up into your parking lot? Well, I did a pull through. Pull through. Yeah. Yeah. Now, while I went to lunch, I backed in. Okay. Yeah. Pull through. That's the safest method of parking. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Well, you uh, you passed today, by the way. Good. Pass, so. How'd you do, Harold? Uh, I, I didn't do as well as Robert did. There we go. I didn't. Uh, we will get back to uh, friction now. And thank you so much for joining us because friction is certainly very important. And Robert, you've got several different perspectives about, about not only driving, but engineering from, from a textile side as well as a great contractor side. Uh, tell me, what uh, why is friction so important to you? I mean, really, Harold, it comes down to safety, you know? Um, and by safety is, you know, safety from an engineering standpoint, safety from a driver standpoint. You know, you want you want the public to have some kind of confidence that when they get on a roadway that they're going to feel safe enough to, you know, maneuver whatever's in front of them, you know, under the under the right conditions. And then all of a sudden, if something is different, like rain, snow, ice, sleet, whatever, right, that they understand that there's accommodations they have to make. To, to maintain that safe level, right? So that friction is just a part of that equation. So uh, safety is important, right? And and there's also that that the control part of it. In other words, there needs to be some kind of definition that says what defines if I'm safe, if that roadway is safe, you know, under normal circumstances, and what defines if it's not safe. So there's a lot of research behind that to define that and to be able to, you know, maintain our roadways to that condition. So, yeah, it definitely is a huge thing. Right. So yeah. and there's a lot that drives that, of course. And a lot of what we'll talk about today is going to, you know, driven around the safety aspect of, of the roadways that we travel on. So, you know, to start this conversation, Robert, we had uh, Richard Izzo, which, you know, mm -hmm. you know, Richard extremely <laughs> no, well as a co-worker. But uh, we had Richard on to tell us what TxDOT is doing about friction and the different research projects and, and other programs that they have to work on uh, wet weather accidents and all kind of different things. So uh, uh, to extend that, we're trying to bring others aware of the importance of, of friction and, and how our materials and how our mix, our mix designs can affect that. So, you know, I, I know previously we talked about a lot of different things about uh, uh, some aggregates and their components and all those type of things. Where, where would you start with this discussion about about friction for our our mixed designs? Well, could you ask that, Harold? Because <laughs> I think the main thing uh, to start with is you kind of defined. There's there's a few definitions that we need to go over because we'll talk about them and how they are affected by the mix type decision or the aggregate decision that you make and what aggregate source you're going to use. So a lot of those things are, are going to use some of this terminology. But I think the main thing, uh, the first thing to talk about is texture. 
and the difference between what we call micro texture and macro texture. And micro texture really is associated with the with the source aggregate. In other words, that interaction between that particular aggregate and the tire that's traveling on it. And then you, when you get into macro texture, that's really kind of an intermediate texture that really plays a role in, in wet weather friction. And so then you start talking about mixes like that are more open graded or more gap graded. So that actually is part of the equation that gives you that skid resistance. That makes sense. Uh, totally, yeah. I, the uh, the <clears throat> mega texture there. That's that's the one that uh, I really had not focused on before. Well, and really, that mega texture is really about construction aspects and really poor construction because you can get into riot issues and a lot of issues. And they quantify that as far as mega texture. This is really what they look. You for. ever drive on a milled surface on your motorcycle? That's, that's mega texture. You yeah. go. That's yeah. mega texture right there. Wow, got you. All right, so next uh, we've talked about several different things uh, just just here today, but uh, tell us about polish. I think polish is one of the next things that you wanted to bring up. Yeah. So speaking of that, so I mean, when you think about a, an aggregate or a, or a mix, either one, right? There's a there's kind of a polishing life. So uh, as as the more um, as the pavement or the aggregate goes through cycles of of wear or the amount of traffic on it or even a time frame right you're going to see this similar cycle right and so what happens is is that initial you see that number start to go up initially right and so what is that what causes that right it's usually when asphalt it's excess asphalt on that surface right starts to come off and then you're getting the you know the their interaction between the tire and the rock itself Right. So and then after that, you start to see that polishing that goes on and the wear that goes on in that material. And then eventually you end up with down at that last phase where you kind of the end of the of the life of, you know, of the of the frictional properties of that you know material or pavement. So it plateaus at some point, just kind of doesn't really fall off completely. You just it, kind of. Yeah, it depends on the material. But yes, you're right. And at some point in time, that's when, you know, decisions need to be made by DOT. Do we need to come back and do something different to address that problem? Gotcha. Right? So, Thank so you. But, but I think the key to understand is that there's a cycle that happens with every material, with every pavement that's out there. Eventually, you know, there's a life cycle associated with that, right? So... The, the functionality, what I call the functionality of a, of a pavement, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, every time I, I think the word polish, I think polish numbers, and then that leads to the, to the skid number, Robert. And, you know, I, I know that's a, a real uh, sacred number that uh, TxDOT keeps, but uh, just, just it seems like there's a lot of mystery behind that. Can you just kind of tell us what those skid numbers are, or, or not, not a specific number, but kind of what that, that index is there? Well, that, that skid value is, is something that, that, that is used to determine whether something needs to be done to a pavement or not. And it also determines, um, you know, what type of treatment needs to be used to address the issue, right? So uh, depending on a lot of different things, whether it's, you know, the, the weather that you have, the temperatures, the, the traffic, the truck traffic, right? A lot of those things are important uh, to understand. So I think all that, you know, kind of leads up to this, you know, and keeping track of that skid value, right? So it's very important that you do. Um, and you're right, it is a huge mystery, mm -hmm. right? And there's a lot of, uh, in fact, you know, when I was at TxDOT, we weren't told a lot of that information, but just because there's a lot of liability out there yeah. associated with those numbers. And those numbers, you know, depending on the time of year, the what lane you, you know, run the test in, all that stuff associated with that is going to affect that number. And when it comes to accidents or wet weather, even even more importantly, wet weather accidents, you know, there's can be a lot of liability out there. So it was everything was kept pretty close to the to the best. So. Um, 
And, and for obvious reasons, not right. that it didn't need to be addressed, but there's a lot of risk out there, sure. and a lot of liability. So, you bet. yeah, totally underst- understandable why it's not talked about yes, and, and why they're not exposed, but it is very important. And that brings us to decisions and the decisions that, that have to be made from, from both sides yeah. uh, to address that. So, yeah, and that's important to know because there's certain things when it comes to affecting, you know, of, uh, or how how our mixed design choices uh, affect, um, you know, resistance to, to frictional properties or skid values. You know, that there's a lot of things that are out there that you can do to affect that. Some of those are in the engineer's right realm, and some of those are in the mixed designer's realm, right? So when you get a set of plans, you're already going to know. I'm using this mix type. I'm using this. Here's the, the surface aggregate classification. Here's the gradation that, you know, that you're asked to use. And then the binder grade, of course, is, is given to you for the most part. So uh, the things we have control over, mainly, you know, what aggregate type are we going to use, right? Mm-hmm. How are we going to put that blend together? The binder source that we're, you know, where it's coming from, not necessarily the gray, but the source. And then actually coming up with that JMF when we go through the design. So with those decisions, then you come to your aggregate type. How, how does that how does that play out? And that's a main, you know, I mean, you understand that, right? So I mean, ultimately, you got to make that's the big choice, right? What exactly. aggregate we're going to use? Yes, right. We go out, we get a big job, we know what the specs are, and then it's okay. What material are we going to use? And and up here is just these are the main aggregate types that are used in the state. I mean, there's a lot of other ones, uh, but the main thing is you've got limestones, you've got the dolomites, granite, you got some gravel sources, trap rock, sandstone. Some of those are class B, some of those are class A. We were talking about surface aggregate classification. Mm-hmm. And really, you know, it comes down to, and those choices are influenced by several things. What do the specifications say we have to do? Is it a class A? Is it a class B? Can we blend? What kind of availability is there, right? Where's the location? Where are we, we going to be able to get the material from? And not only that, but what kind of proximity to transportation? Does it have to be hauled by truck? Can we get it on rail? What is the, you know, because that all kind of ties into the economics of it. Those are all huge impacts that, you know, when you're putting a design together, right, mm-hmm. that affects that. Not only that, but what hot mix plants are going to come out of if you've got more than one plant, right? You bet. So those are all very important um, decisions. But ultimately, you got to come up with a material, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned SAC several times, certain yeah. segregate classification. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Okay. Um, yeah, so surface aggregate classification, that is really, a, and, and, and most people know this, but for those who are, are, are not as familiar, it's it's really to say, do I have a, a material that's classified for surface friction, has the surface frictional characteristic that you're looking for? And for the most part, you'll see that stack A, which is that surface material, You'll see that specified on most uh, surface mixes. Lower lifts, a lot of times they will use a class B. Now, I don't know if it's always necessary to use a class A. I mean, I'm I'm sitting here. Mm-hmm. That's probably a good discussion point, it is. right? It is. Uh, and and there's also that discussion around these B plus aggregates, right? Correct. Because if you think about it, and you look at this list, most there there there's way more class B. Um, sources than there are class A. Yeah. And so you, you're you limited, right, to these class A materials. doesn't mean that, you know, it, it, ultimately you need to meet the frictional properties of the mix, right? But are there other ways to do that? And I think Textile's been looking at you know, looking at a little more about the class, the you know, the B plus aggregate. You bet. So um, anyway, that's uh, well, one thing, well, I see up there you have one class A or one limestone in dolomite beats a class A. Yeah. It's one. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Just one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What's the most predominant 
so um, aggregate type in Texas. It's yeah. limestone. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it is limestone. And there's out of all those, there's one that meets the class A. And I think somebody can chime in if if I'm wrong, but I think it's the Lattimore material. Okay. I think that's the class A material. Wow. Got you. If I'm not mistaken. But. So it sounds like to me there's a finite quantity of this material and we should use it wisely. Is that a reasonable statement? I, I think so. Yeah, I think we should always be using our material wisely, you know. Okay. But uh, absolutely. I mean, I you know, you that conversation comes up. Yeah. It, it kind of comes and goes. But, it, you know, and it's always. But, but I think Richard kind of said it well at one point in time. Richard was really. Um, I said, you know, if we know, if we know in advance how much material we're going to need, we have a a lot better chance to supply it. And I think some of the suppliers have said that as well. Like, yeah. please let give us, us know. Yeah. Give us a plan. Give us out far enough advance so that we know, you know, what we're, we're what we're up against, and so that we can plan for and be able to supply the material that's needed. You know, I think that's what Chuck Fuller was really good about in some of our, our uh, PIQ meetings when that question would come up is that we just need to plan because there's a lot of different districts, there's a lot of different mm -hmm. entities beside TxDOT that are, that are now specifying more class A. That's right. So we need to be in communication with our suppliers to, to make sure there's going to be an adequate supply of, of that material for all the work that we have going on. So. Right. To, to your point and, and Richard's point, there just needs to be a plan and That's communication right. going on with class A. You're right. All right. You mentioned blending. So tell us a little bit more about blending. That's uh, using uh, class yeah, A, class did, B. We did talk about that blending. And I, and I think blending, uh, you know, all the most of the specifications will allow some blending of class B with class A. I mean, that's that's been in the spec for a long time. Now you will see notes from time to time that say no blending, right? Right. And and there's obvious other reasons, but one of the reasons that they do that is because of what you're seeing here. And you'll see some of the class A material mixed with the class B material. This is obviously a stone on stone mix. It looks kind of like an SMA, but you see what happens if you have a really hard class A with a really kind of softer class B, you can crush the class B mm. and you're seeing some of that crushed aggregate in there. Sure. Wow. And so what that does is, of course, it leads to degradation of the mix, right? Mm -hmm. And leads to premature failure. So that's exactly why that you have to be really careful. And, and some of the districts came out with some guidelines to say, oh, well, the class A or the class B has to be within the certain you know, a certain amount of points of, in the class A. Um, uh, you know, I don't forget the exact requirements, but there's some different ideas that were, you know, discussed uh, as far as how to do that. But I think that's important when you go to blend. You need to make sure you know what you're blending and it's not going to cause this kind of issue down the road. So very important. Yeah. So what about the uh, the grading portion of that? We see more open graded mixes at St. Black and gap graded, those type of things. How, how does that grading play into to friction? I mean, I think when, when engineers make decisions, I mean, and, and I'm not talking about gradation here. I'm talking about the general grading, right? Whether it's dense graded, gap graded, open graded. You bet. And I, and I think you're going to see, for the most part, I think that you're going to see more of the gap graded and the open graded when you get into a lot of the wet weather areas, right? Mm -hmm. Some of those kind of decisions are very much more important to, to places like in Houston where they've got a lot of rainfall, right? You're going to see that. And you're going to see those because they don't want necessarily, they want that water off the surface. Mm -hmm. They want to reduce that, you know, hydroplaning. They want that, that threat of hydroplaning. They want to, reduce that back spray. There's a lot of things you want to be able to do, but basically get the water off of there, right? So. Like our PFC. Like PFC, yeah. And you and you see that, right? So. Um, that brings us to the mix type. So tell yeah. us about. Well, that's uh, a perfect example right yeah. there. So there you've got, <laughs> that's Houston, Beltway 8, you know. And, that's uh, a nice looking roadway. Very nice looking roadway. Um, but it was it was put in the area where they they had issues with some wet weather accidents and guess what they, you know it, it was 
very successful project. But but when you start to talk about mixed types, right, you've got a lot of choices. Designers have a lot of choices, mm-hmm. and they can put a lot of things into that. And you know that. And I'll say this about this. So, you know, as you these, if you start with a dense graded, really, you're relying dense grade super paper you're relying really. Um, you're relying a lot on um, the frictional characteristics of the rock, right? And 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 then you get into these other mixes as you get into SMA thin bonded wearing courses PFC. You start to rely on that macro texture, that openness, right? And so. Uh, there's a shift there, right? And so, so, so it tells me that there's more than one way to, you know, I guess skin the cat, if you, you know, for no, no, no praise to say it, but there's, you're solving that frictional problem mm-hmm. or addressing that frictional problem, but you can do it in a different way, right? So. There's also a sound component, sound reduction component, as you course, not particularly with PFCs, and I think that may be one of the yes. issues with the with the Beltway Eight job, right? That's it. There definitely is. It's it's not only that you're you're getting rid of the water and the back spray, and you're also providing some noise attenuation as well, which does really help. You know. So look at the different mix types there. Uh, I know the question has come up. Well, can you make that dense graded mix have the same friction as as an SMA or same friction as as another type of mix? Yes, and I mean you can you can coarsen it up, but there's only on a on a on a dense graded mix you can only coarsen it up so much. Okay. I think there's a limit to that, right? And then, hence, does, you know, some does, of the, at some point it becomes not a dense grade anymore. That's right. That's you know? right. Mm-hmm. It becomes something like a you know a super pay, and then that's kind of the whole move towards super pay. That's kind of in between dense and an SMA, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm talking about Houston, you know, wet weather. I mean, that's always important. And we kind of talked about that before, but there's just some obvious data that says, you know what, when you've got water, guess what? That reduce, that reduces the skid resistance, increases that, you know, that, that room for, uh, I guess, uh, you know, skid resistance, right? So, mm-hmm. Um, and and that's that's true no matter what what mix you put on there, right? You're, every once in a while, you're going to get enough water on a surface that even um, a PSC is not going to be able to accommodate. I mean, you, so you know, there's nothing's guaranteed, right? So mm-hmm. so you just plan for the the best situation, the optimal situation, and then understanding that guess what? Sometimes I got to just slow down. Right. I mean, I think there's still some common sense that goes on there, right? Because I used to hear that argument. Well, we put PFC and it's quieter and it's, you know, and it's, it's takes all the water off and people are just going to want to drive faster and faster. Mm -hmm. I used to hear that logic. I'm like, "Mm, you still, you still have to use some common sense, (laughs) right? You know, I mean, so you have those redundancies in place, and Dale Rainey's always talking about redundancy, you know. You have the, the friction around the curve, you know, the, the treatment around the curve, and but that you also still have the guardrail, right, sure. just in case. Or the rumble strips yeah, on the edge, right? So, you, you know, there's other things you do to kind of have redundancy in the system, right? So That's the belt and suspenders approach. To it totally, yeah, it is the belt and suspenders. You're right. <laughs> All right, so we we mentioned uh, grading. What about gradation? Because we always yeah. have gradations in our specifications that we have to meet. And that's a you know, and that's a really good point. That's one of the things that we have a lot of control over as mix designers. You know, and, and when you're designing a dense graded mix, I mean, that's kind of what it is. It's a dense graded mix. So I think you have to be careful, right? Because you can end up getting a mix too fine. Mm-hmm. And then there's tendencies of having, you know, material migrating to the surface like this picture on the left. And so you get into that situation. Well, guess what? I guarantee you, you know, that that skid number is going to cause you some issues. Yeah. And we've had those issues happen on some jobs and we've had to kind of come in. But once you go out and take that measurement, once you know that number. 
then the liability is on you because you have to address it at that time, right? So uh, that's why we've gone to some of the things like stone on stone, con- you know, concept, and because it gives you a little more macro texture, right? Mm-hmm. And it also it, it doesn't have as much much fines, right? Exactly. And so you're not relying on those fines for frictional resistance as much. So. Um, so that's so there is that issue, you're right? So, uh, but gradation is hugely important. And, I, 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 and you know, we talk about you know the direction that TextDot is going with with um, materials and on SuperPave about designing below the reference zone, right? Exactly. So, and, and I think that kind of checks a lot of those boxes on the stone to stone, and it definitely is it's, it's going to be a help with frictional properties as well. So but I think we can we can also get two cores. Yes, you can. So they're like like everything, there's a balance. That's right. Yeah. It is. You can get two cores and that has its own set of issues as well. So you know Robert our discussion beforehand you brought up something I didn't even think about and that was our uh, liquid binder, our liquid asphalt on these projects yeah. has an effect also. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily think so, but uh, binder plays a, a pretty important role. And if you think about kind of the conceptual difference between a non-modified versus a modified binder, right? Then you're actually, uh, when you look at a non-modified binder, it has a tendency to want to migrate. It wants to move around in that mix, especially if you've got a lot of traffic or you, or if you've got, um, you know, a, a hot, very hot summer, mm-hmm. right? There's going to be this tendency for it to want to kind of move around. Modified or polymer in there kind of helps hold it in place. Same as a PFC with the fiber in it, right? It's kind of holding it in place because you've seen all of a sudden the fiber feet are not working or something. All of a sudden, guess what? Man, that asphalt's going everywhere, right? It's right. coming to, and it's going to come to the surface because that's where it's wanting to migrate to. So, uh, binder definitely plays an important role. Um, and it also, if you think about some of the, Mixes like SMA and PSC that have a lot of film thickness. So you you kind of it's important to kind of control right that binder around that rock, and you want it to stay you want it to stay relatively in place. So you know the more and more we talk about uh, different things that affect the quality of the mix, so the more I'm I'm starting to understand film thickness and how important that is that we are getting that good coating yeah. of that accurate. No, and I, I agree with you, and, and I and I kind of wish that was something that we talked about a little bit more in the yeah. industry, only because, um, you know, you've seen some agencies out there that'll say, well, we want a minimum AC content, yeah. right? And that's great as long as absorption of the in the rock is all the same, but it's not. It's different. So you've got very hard, dense aggregate that has little absorption, and you've got some softer absorptive material, and those are different, they absorb different amount of asphalt, right? Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, if I've got the same asphalt I'm putting in there, well, all of a sudden I've got more, way more effective asphalt. You could cause issues just around the fact that you're having to put a minimum AC content in there, you know? But if you look to film thickness, that's just around that rock, right? The yeah. amount of asphalt around that particular aggregate. And that really is the more important number to look at. So, man. What else in friction? Do you have any other tidbits for us or any other uh, important elements of uh, friction we need to think about? And, you know, uh, you know, and it kind of reminds me back when, when this high friction surface courses started coming out. You started seeing those projects. Yeah. And, and a great solution, right? But as we all know, they're it's pretty expensive because yes. it's a, a certain type of uh, Epoxy, binder, a certain, certain type, type of, of aggregate. That's this bauxite yeah. aggregate. It's got to come, I don't know where it's coming from, but it's China. from here. That's where it's from. China, yeah. Yeah, it comes from China, you know, is, and so is that in East Texas? Yeah, I think it's, that, yeah, a little <laughs> suburb outside of San Antonio. <laughs> trying to grow. Anyway, China, yeah, that's trying to grow. But anyway, um, you know, kind of makes you start to think, well, what can we do, right? 
locally with local materials, with local, you know, construction efforts to be able to solve some of those problems, right? And there's ways we can do that and, and still be economical, right? And provide just as good a solution. So anyway, I, I'm not, not, not just counting that's a great product, but, uh, you know, I think there's other, other things out there as well, you know. Well, I think that's a great way to summarize uh, that we all need to be aware. We need to be aware that our materials can make a difference in friction. Our mixed designs can make a difference. The the mixed type that we're using, all these different elements uh, have, a, have a role with friction. And, you know, I, I like to make sure that we're just, uh, with your knowledge and, and, and our industry's knowledge, along with TxDOT, to just keep that communication going. You know, we, we need to keep communicating to remind ourselves how important friction is because, you know, we open it up talking about safety. Friction is a safety thing. And it is. And it's a confidence thing in driving. I mean, That's right. You mentioned that before. And so we want to make sure that that when our families are out there driving on the roadways, that when they're expecting to uh, to slow down or stop, they will be. They'll have the friction to where they can do that. That's what's vitally uh, important in my That's mind. Right. So, uh there's lots of things I think we need to do to keep that awareness going to make sure everybody's going to be safe out there on the roadway. I, I agree. I agree. And I think you still, you know, with all these, you know, uh, redundancies in place to mm -hmm. keep us safe, I think it's still important that we use common sense mm -hmm. and you use some good judgment, right? I had a, we had some people in our neighborhood blaring down our street mm -hmm. and and there were kids at the other end of the street, you know, and, and of course, you know, my wife and her infinite wisdom stepped out and stopped the vehicle. Right. And so, you know, no, and, and we're having this conversation and she's like talking to them and they go, well, the speed limit's 30 miles an hour on the street and we're, we're in time. I'm like, but you got to use some common sense. If there's kids down at the end of the street, yeah, they're not, you know, you're in the vehicle, they're out on foot. So I think it, you know, you do, you have to use a little bit of common sense and good judgment and understanding that I'm trying to keep not only myself safe, but everybody else safe too. So you bet. Yeah. Before I let you depart, uh, we've already invited Robert Lee to be a speaker at Texapa's annual meeting this year, which is that. going to be in September. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Robert, no, you guess do. what? You're invited to speak no, at Texapa's annual okay. meeting. So. But no, seriously, you have done a great job, you and, uh, and uh, CRH, uh, of working on your quality initiatives there and have done a great job. Just tell us a little bit about some of the things that uh, that, that you could talk to us about at our annual meeting when it comes to that quality initiative. No, I, I just think that quality is very important. And and uh, and I think, you know, it's, it, at least in our realm of what we do in, in CRH, it's it's important across the board for us. I mean, we, 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 we strive for that. And, mm -hmm. and I think the main thing is having awareness mm -hmm. and, and once you have awareness and you kind of have some benchmarks on where to, to target, then all of a sudden it kind of just takes over. And all of a sudden people start to go, Oh, I can do that. I can do this. Wow. There's a, and so it is one of those things that's kind of a grassroots, I hate to call it that, but it's really more of a grassroots movement where we have to be intentional about it, set some good goals, and understand what those goals mean and how they how they translate to overall better quality of kind of what we do, the mixes we make and the mixes we lay. So right. That's fantastic. What a great story. We're looking forward to having Robert come down and talk to us about that in San Antonio in September. Uh, Robert, I just want to say thank you very much for uh, continuing our conversation on friction to talk about the importance of friction and uh, all the all the decisions we have to make there when it comes to that. So uh, thank you, bud. Appreciate you bet. it. You bet. You bet. Enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, other than a couple of questions, you know, <laughs> get me stirred up. But other than that, yeah, we're good. Oh, I've got lots of good. Yeah, I know for you. you. Do. I know. I won't take that away from you. But yeah. Besides that, you know what? What about putting a big smile on your face and get some of that great Texas sunshine on you? Great to see you. Talk to you later.